Good evening, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. Turn with me, first of all, please, to the Epistle to the Hebrews, the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 9. In verse 9, which is a symbol for the present time, a symbol. It's speaking of the holy place as a symbol. And in the same chapter, verse 24, for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven. The physical elements of the temple in Jerusalem and of the city are symbols, object lessons, illustrations to teach us things about heaven. The complication when we speak of the new Jerusalem is it is not the present one. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. One of the reasons there will be a new heaven is this. Satan has access to the throne of God in the present heaven. We see this in the book of Zechariah. We see this in the book of Revelation. We see this in the book of Job. In the new Jerusalem, Satan will have absolutely no access. He'll have no access. He's the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us before the throne, but he will have no place in the new Jerusalem. Therefore, there must be not only heaven, but a new heaven. Hence, what no eye hath seen, what ear heard hath the Lord prepared for those who loved him. With this in view, please, turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay. Then in verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, her brilliance. Notice her, it's referred to in the feminine again as a bride was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. And it goes on describing it architecturally. The 12 foundations, obviously, corresponding, the 12 gates corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 patriarchs of Israel, and the 12 apostles. The meaning of the gold is that which is eternal. It's a non-corrosive metal. It does not oxidize. All of these precious stones have meanings. They all reflect things. We have the pearl, the pearl of great price, and so forth. It would be exhaustive in itself to go through all of the Bible and explain what these precious stones mean, but they are symbols of spiritual things. We go on reading about this new Jerusalem uh, for those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and in verse 22, he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. This river we also see alluded to in Ezekiel 47. In a millennial context, we see it in John chapter 7. It is Maim Hayim, Maim Hayim living water. The Spirit of God is flowing like a river. One of the reasons we will need a millennial reign of Christ, now there are various reasons there must be a millennial reign of Christ. One of the reasons, however, is this. God had an original plan for man, and he had an original plan for the planet. It was defiled by sin. The plans of God cannot be thwarted by either the designs of Satan or the fall of man. The original plan that God had for man and for the biosphere, for the planet, must still be realized. God's original plan cannot be thwarted by sin or by Satan or by man. What God originally intended, the millennial reign of Christ will be what would have happened had Adam and Eve not sinned. But there is another aspect of the millennial reign of Christ. We cannot comprehend eternity. 
we cannot comprehend the new Jerusalem. A is to B as B is to C, we might say. One is to two as two is to three. There are certain things now in this life or this world which can give us a very vague concept, a very dim view of the millennium. The love, the beauty, the innocence of a newborn baby. That teaches something about God's love for us as a father, as a mother, as a father. A beautiful landscape, something unspoiled in its majesty by pollution or by man. Just look at the Grand Canyon. There are certain things which give us some vague concept of what the millennium will be like, a perfect world. A trip to Maui or Kauai, something spectacular, some idea. The fellowship of God's people. These things all give us some hint about what the millennium is going to be like. The thousand-year reign. If somebody who's a Christian is diagnosed with six months to live, no, they do not have six months to live. They have at least 1,000 years plus six months to live. <laughs> Don't believe it. The diagnosis is wrong for the believer. Okay. Why trust in what you're going to get out of this life, 80, 90 years or whatever you're going to get out of it, and get sick and get old anyway. Even if you live to be 100, who cares when you can have it for 1,000 where you don't get sick and old. But there is another dimension to the millennial reign of Christ. Jesus himself will personally teach us the things of the Father. Jesus himself will personally teach us about eternity for that thousand years when he reigns from Jerusalem. Because of sin, because of what's happened, we can't relate to something like this. Not even dimly. We just know it's there. It'll take a thousand years for Jesus to prepare us for what no eye had seen or ear had heard the Lord has prepared for those who loved him. That is one of the reasons why there must be a millennium. In fact, I would even argue it's the chief reason. Now, there are other reasons for the millennium. The original plan God has for Israel, had for Israel when Jesus came the first time, that must be realized, and it will be realized in the millennial reign of Christ. The original plan God had for the biosphere, for the human race, well, that will be realized in the millennial reign of Christ. But also, it's when Jesus will teach us personally the things of eternity. Yet we do see that this river, you imbibe it, we take his spirit into ourselves. And it causes the tree to bear fruit. This tree is the tree of life. We call it in Hebrew, the Eitz Hayim. In Judaism, the ancient rabbis taught the Eitz Hayim, the tree of life, is represented by a fig tree. We must go back to the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They tried to justify themselves, covering their nakedness by sowing leaves together. Here we see the leaves are for the healing of the nations. There's leaves and there's fruit. Jesus said, or when Adam heard God walking in the garden, it was Jesus. Jesus told him, what are you doing with the fig leaves? He slew animals and covered him with the skins of the animals. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Man cannot justify himself with his good works. The leaves are pictures of good works. There's nothing wrong with leaves. They're for the healing of the nations. But they don't save anybody. Remember, regenerate Christians do good works because they have been saved, not in order to get saved. The idea of doing works to get saved will never justify anybody, not even an Albert Schweitzer, not even a great, wonderful humanitarian. Nobody will ever be saved by fig leaves. The only thing that will cover the nakedness of sin is the blood of the Lamb. But that's not to say there's anything wrong with the leaves. It's just that fallen man will try to justify himself with good works. Look what I'm doing. We have two perversions of Christianity that are quite popular in the world. One is Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism actually teaches that if you say you have the assurance of salvation, 
you have committed the sin of presumption. Okay. Roman Catholics have to do good works to get saved. Go to the novena, have the sacraments, the mass, all this. It's works-based. The other is hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinists do good works to try to prove they are saved. I must be saved. Look what I'm doing. Both will make you neurotic. <laughs> Neither are biblical. Neither can give the assurance of salvation. Am I elect? I must be elect. Look what I'm doing. <laughs> Neither can give the assurance of salvation. But Jesus can and does give the assurance of salvation. Now let's understand they sewed the fig leaves together. Every religion in the world, it doesn't matter if it's the Jehovah's Witness or the Mormon knocking on the door, the Muslim going on the Hajj, the Catholic going to the Novena, it doesn't matter what it is, the Orthodox Jews keeping the mitzvot. They are all sewing fig leaves together, trying to justify themselves. There's nothing wrong with the leaves, but they don't save anybody. Jesus cursed the fig tree. Why? Israel had a work righteousness based on the law. It did not have the fruit of the Spirit. To understand the fruit on this tree, we have to understand the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. It is the divine nature. We in the New Jerusalem will become partakers of the divine nature. Adam and Eve chose to eat of the wrong tree, as it were, the knowledge of good and evil, to establish a law to themselves, their own standard of right and wrong, as it were, deification, auto-deification. That's what it was, making themselves into God. In Israel, because of the sun, it's like Arizona, you've been there, most of you. Without the leaves, the figs would be destroyed by the sun. You need the leaves. The leaves generally appear just before or about the same time as the figs. If there's no leaves, the fruit will be burned up. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. The problem wasn't that it had leaves. The problem was that there was no fruit under the leaves. You need leaves. If somebody is really a believer, it'll be evident in the way they live and what they do. A tree will bear fruit, but it will bear leaves. Here we see the tree has both. It has the fruit, but it also has the leaves. We will become partakers of the divine nature in the new Jerusalem. We share in his likeness. We drink of his spirit. We become like Jesus. Now, in a sense, in a real sense, we should already be bearing that fruit we should already be having those leaves. The new creation should be bearing the fruit of the Spirit. The older we get in Jesus, the more Christ-like we should become. The older we get in Jesus, the more fruit of the Spirit we should bear. The first fruit of the Spirit is love. The others come from love. Amen. And there should be leaves. This, however, is only, again, a very, very, very dim foreshadowing of what it is going to be like in the New Jerusalem. Who is going to be in the New Jerusalem? Those who are bearing good fruit now. Now, if there's not good works, there will not be good fruit. It will get burned up. <laughs> Nobody is putting down the works. But religion is based on works. The gospel is not. Remember, religion is man trying to reach God. Jesus is God trying to reach man. The gospel is the diametric opposite of religion. Spiritually, theologically, and philosophically, the gospel is the diametric opposite of what most people consider to be religion. Religion is man trying to reach God. The gospel of Jesus is God trying to reach man. 
They do good works to get saved. We do good works because we've been saved. For them, it's based on leaves. He's a good Muslim. He's a good Catholic. He's a good Jew. He did this. He did that. They donated this and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> no. For us, the leaves are simply a consequence of bearing fruit. You can have a nice tropical plant here of some description. Well, it's there, but it doesn't really show you what a tropical jungle is like. <laughs> it only gives you a minute hint of what a tropical jungle is like. Well, what we are now is not what we shall be. A Christian who is bearing the fruit of the Spirit, a church that is fruitful, is a dim hint about what this is going to be like. So incredible, the Scripture says, no eye hath seen it or ear hath heard what God has prepared for those who loved him. So beyond any human concept, it's going to take Jesus personally a thousand years to teach us about what it's going to be like. That's quite a thing, isn't it? Now, we can't relate to that. It's just beyond us to relate to that. What we can relate to is the millennium. What would a perfect world look like? A world where Christ was king, when the government was on his shoulders instead of politicians. Where everything ran according to his principles and his law. Where love and justice prevailed. We can relate to that in some sense. One is to two as two is to three. Do you understand? But now let's understand the other aspect of the bride, the bride of new Jerusalem. There's much that can be said about the bride and the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we have a tape on uh, Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding. There's much that can be said, but the bride is adorned for her husband. The bride is adorned for her husband. Now, when you read the Song of Solomon, the bride has a coiffure and the bride has cosmetics and all this kind of thing. But Peter, writing to Jewish believers, uses a diminutive which the translators put in, Christian women adorn yourselves modestly. It doesn't actually say that in Greek, but it's a diminutive. That's the idea in back of it. But when Paul is writing to Greeks, Greek Christians, or people say that of the pagan world, he says that Christian women should not wear makeup or cosmetics at all. Why? Well, that's cultural. In the Hebrew world, cosmetics and coffees and things like this did not mean what it meant in the Greek world. In the Greek world, it was the uniform of the hieros gamos, of the temple prostitutes, okay? It was the uniform of cult prostitution. It was to identify a woman as <coughs> sexually available for money to the honor of some pagan deity, Athena or whatever, okay? Hence, in one culture, something was wrong, and in another culture, it wasn't. Culture is a big factor. It's a very big factor. But no matter what someone's culture, all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God, and all need salvation. So we have the idea of the bride. Jesus continually used this idea of the bride to try to teach about his coming, about eternity, about heaven, about the marriage supper. It's bound up in the typology of the Paschal meal. It's bound up in many things, not the least of which is the second half of the Olivet Discourse. Turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 25. <coughs> the second half of the Olivet Discourse. Then the kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. 
And the foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, saying, no, there'll not be enough for us and for you also. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom uh, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day or the hour. Now notice again in verse 13 of Matthew 25, Jesus reiterates what he said in Matthew chapter 24. Be on the alert. Rick Warren says, don't worry about it, avoid end time prophecy. You either believe the New Testament or the purpose-driven lie. Either Jesus was telling the truth or Rick Warren is. One of them is teaching the truth. One of them is teaching error. You have to decide. You cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ and a follower of Rick Warren. You cannot believe the New Testament and the purpose-driven lie. I say that for those watching on the Internet. Be alert. Now, the New Jerusalem will have certain differences. The physical Jerusalem is a copy, a shadow. But the new Jerusalem will not be that kind of a replica. It says the Lamb himself, Christ himself, will be the lamp. <laughs> you won't need a tabernacle. As such, he'll be dwelling in us. But the bride is there. The bride. In the last week of Jesus' life, and in the days leading up to it, what Christians call Passion Week, for the Jews was the preparation for Passover week, Hag Matzot. And what we see happening in the Gospels, all four Gospels, of that week of preparation for the Passover when Jesus would die, Jesus is taking what is read in the synagogue and in those days in the temple and applying it to himself messianically. A Jewish liturgy it's called the Siddur, Siddur from the Hebrew Lesader, to set in order. But a festal Siddur, a festal liturgy, is called a Machzor, a Machzor. Don't worry about this, but this is what it is. And you have a special kind of liturgy at the Passover, also called a Haggadah, a Haggadah. The Passover week, or the preparations for Passover week begins with the singing of the Hallel Rabbah, the great praise, Psalm 113 to 118. The Hallel Rabbah is actually sung twice a year, also at the Feast of Tabernacles, but on Palm Sunday, <coughs> they were singing Psalm 113 to 118. Passover was a pilgrim feast where Jews had to come from all over, if they could, to celebrate it, along with the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Weeks. And by Jesus' day, Hanukkah was effectively a fourth pilgrim feast. They would congregate on the Mount of Olives, Hadaziatim, and be led by the Levitical choirs across the Kidron through the East Gate, the Shad Akamim. And they would sing the Hallel Rabbah. They would know they were approaching the city when the Levitical choir would reach the refrain. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. <coughs> His mercies endure forever. They would sing this quite loudly, fortissimo, as the Levites went underneath the Shah Harakamim, towards the Nakanah gate, and they would begin singing, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, barachnu hem mi bet Adonai, hodula Adonai ki tov ki le olam chazdo, hoshana hoshana, save us, save us. And we explain the background to this on our Palm Sunday tape. That was the liturgy. Well, if you read Psalm 118, you see what's there. The building block that was rejected has become the cornerstone. And Jesus begins to tell them, if these remain silent, the stones will cry out. Remember? What did we say? 1 Peter 2, 5, we are the stones of the temple. What Jesus was saying in Jewish metaphor is, if the Jews don't proclaim me as Messiah, Christians will. You understand? We're the stones of the temple. 
He also said, have you not heard the stone that the builders rejected has become the Rosh Pinah, the cornerstone? He took what was being read in the temple and in the synagogue liturgy and is still read in the synagogue liturgy to this day. A cantor, a chazan, will sing it and applied it to himself messianically. Well, the Saturday of Passover week, the Shabbat of Hagmatzot, to this very day in the synagogue, is read one of the five Megidot, the five scrolls, HaMegillah HaShir HaShirim, the Song of Songs is what's read. Song of Song is based on two dreams, her best dream and her worst nightmare. That's what was being read in the synagogue. And so Jesus takes what was being read in the synagogue and in the temple liturgy and applies it to himself. Now understand when he rose from the dead and Mary came into the garden, she supposed him to be the gardener, it said, when she saw Jesus. Well, if you read the Song of Solomon, what did she just read in the synagogue? Come into the garden, my beloved, my bride, my perfect one. You understand what was happening? What was being read in the synagogue, he applies to himself. Turn with me to understand this to the Song of Solomon, the Shir Hashirim. In the Hebrew text, we know what the bride is singing, what the bridegroom is singing, and what the witnesses to their romance are singing from the gender and number of the Hebrew text. What's masculine, what's feminine, what's singular, and what's plural. Solomon's romance with Shulamit becomes the picture of the Messiah's romance with Israel. Some have proposed that the Song of Solomon is simply a Christian or a biblical or a Jewish guide to marital romance. It is that, but it's more than that. The reason we know it is figurative of Christ's relationship with his bride, the church, is because the way Jesus interpreted it and implied it at Hagmatzot to himself which is consistent with what he kept doing, taking the synagogue and temple liturgy and saying, now it's fulfilled in me. For instance, look at chapter 4, verse 6. Until the cool of day, when the shadows flee away, I will go to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. Solomon, the male, is a picture of the bridegroom. Shulamit is a picture of the bride. And the witnesses to their romance correspond to Hatseva O Tashamayim, the hosts of heaven, the angelic witnesses singing the refrain. He'll go to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. When Jesus was born, the Magi came. They brought him gold because he'd be a king. They brought him incense because he would be a priest who would bring the acceptable prayers, worship to God. And they brought him myrrh because he would be anointed for burial. When Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came to anoint the corpse of Jesus, they bought a mixture of aloes and myrrh. Hence the bridegroom comes to die for the bride. He goes to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. What was the perfect incense? Father, forgive them. He anointed for burial. He told uh, the harlot who anointed his feet when she repented, Jesus said, she has anointed me for burial. Look, please, chapter 5. I've come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I've gathered my myrrh and my balsam. Well, what happens when Mary comes into the tomb and the stone is rolled away? The fragrance of the myrrh was still in the tomb, he, but he had risen. She thought he was the gardener. That's what she had just read a matter of hours earlier in the temple or the synagogue. You understand? That's what she had just read ritually. Now it's being fulfilled in Jesus. It's largely, however, constructed around two dreams. There's more to it than this, but it's constructed around two dreams. Let's look at her first dream, chapter 3. 
In the time of Jesus, the second temple period, as we teach on the uh, tape, which is in the newsletter, on the uh, parable of the wedding, a Jewish wedding marriage had three phases. The first phase was betrothal, engagement, only engagement was not like our engagement. It was legally binding. It was the contractual legal phase of the marriage. The second was the nuptial, the ceremonial or ritual phase. And the third was consummation of the relationship. All three phases needed to take place for the wedding to be valid by Jewish law. In other words, if the Roman Catholic Church teaching that Mary was a perpetual virgin is right, Jesus was born out of wedlock. Mary and Joseph were not legitimately married. How dishonoring to Mary and Joseph, the holy family as Catholics call it, if they did not consummate their marriage. But of course the Gospels say they did. Nonetheless, that's the way it is. To this day, there's also a Jewish wedding contract called a ketubah, a ketubah, a legal obligation. Well, we have a ketubah, the covenant. Once the bridegroom was betrothed, he was legally obligated to come back for the bride after going away to prepare a place for her and come back about a year later. Normally, normally, for cultural reasons, these betrothals took place in the season of love, spring. Even so many of our Western and modern traditions like spring cleaning and spring fever come from the Song of Solomon. The Bedi Chachemetz, the Jews that have to clean all the leaven out of the house to celebrate the Passover and so forth and still do to this day. Well, these have ancient origins in biblical culture. So it's the season of love when everything's blossoming. The winter is over. The plants are beginning to blossom in the flora and the trees are getting green and so forth. The nuptial is arranged and frequently you'd meet a bride because all the pilgrims would come to Jerusalem. So it was a time of matchmaking. It was considered to be a particular blessing to marry a Bat Yerushalayim, a daughter of Jerusalem. I met my wife in Jerusalem. It's certainly my blessing, but it was her curse. But anyway... He'd have to come back a year later. She would not know the day or the hour. She would not know the day or the hour. She would just know he'd have to come back. It would usually be before the journey to Jerusalem, where they'd eat the Passover. That would be like the mar a marriage supper. But it would always be at night. He's coming like a thief in the night. Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? Work while you have the light. Night will come. No man can work. And in both the Song of Solomon and Matthew 25, the bridegroom comes in the night. <coughs> Let's read chapter 3, verse 1. <coughs> now we know from the Hebrew that it begins with the bride. She's singing. On my bed, night after night, I sought him, who my soul loves. I sought him, but did not find him. I must arise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I must seek him, who my soul loves. I sought him, but I did not find him. The watchmen who make the rounds of the city found me, and I said, Have you seen him, who my soul loves? Scarcely had I left them when I found him whom my soul loves. And I held on to him and would not let him go until I'd brought him to my mother's house into the room of her who conceived me. Okay. She's desperately, madly in love with him. He is desperately, madly in love with her. And night after night, it's the same story. Is he coming tonight? Is he coming tonight? Is he coming tonight? The Son of Man comes at an hour you do not expect. She knew by the signs of the seasons that the time of his coming was getting closer. But she did not know the day or the hour. She just knew it would be at night. Is tonight the night? I can't sleep. He might come tonight. I can't sleep. He might come tonight. She's out in the streets looking for him just in case he shows up that night. Is he coming tonight? Boy, does she want to get married. Well, let's look. 
She goes out to the policemen, as it were, the watchmen who make the rounds. Have you seen him? Now in verse 5, something happens. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hinds of the fields, that you will not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. The King James makes a mistake, I believe. It is the feminine. Uh, she pleases. But it's the bridegroom, the masculine, doing the singing. Don't awaken her until she pleases. This is reiterated continually in the Song of Solomon, in the refrain, in the chorus. Don't awaken my beloved until she pleases. We are not waiting for Jesus to come back. He is waiting for the bride to be ready. Remember what Jesus said? When the crop permits, the Lord of the harvest sends the harvesters. We are not waiting for Jesus to come back. He's waiting for us to be ready. He's coming for a spotless, immaculate bride. That's what he's coming for. Now, we have to be very careful. The bride is always corporate. Be careful of, and I've even heard of some so-called Christians doing it. They personalize Jesus as a personal lover. This is completely sick and perverse. It is a paganistic concept that existed in the ancient world of copulating with the gods. That's like Zeus copulating with a human woman and, and, and Hercules being born, this kind of thing. It was a pagan origin. It is the basis of nuns who say that they would take their vows, they're brides of Christ, and they, Jesus is their betrothal. And when they take their vows, it's considered a wedding ceremony. And you had mystical Catholic nuns, Teresa of Avila and these people, would actually read the Song of Solomon as erotic literature, fantasizing about Jesus as a personal lover. This is completely twisted and perverse. And I've heard of so-called evangelicals hyper-charismatics getting caught up in the same rubbish in recent years. It is absolute nonsense. The bride is always corporate, not personal. Okay? Much the same as Israel was God's woman, your husband is your maker, so the church is the bride of Christ. Well, let's look. She's desperate for him to come. Don't awaken her until she pleases. Jesus may know it now in eternity. We assume he does. But when he was on earth, he said... I don't know when I'm coming, only the Father. He didn't know when he was, why? Because relative to us, it is a variable. Relative to us, it's a variable. It's not when is the Lord going to come, it's when is the church going to be ready for him to come. That's what it's about. We're actually told we can hasten his coming. By leading people to Christ and seeing them get disciples, we can hasten his coming. <laughs> you really want him to come. Well, what happens here? He shows up, and he comes, and off they go, and they live happily ever after. That's her best dream. That's chapter 3 of the Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs. Now let's look at her worst nightmare. Turn to chapter Five of the Song of Songs, please. Once more, I've come to my garden, my sister, my bride. Verse 2, I was asleep. Now it changes to the feminine again. Verse 1 is the masculine. Verse 2, it goes back to the feminine. I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice, my beloved was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. My head is drenched with dew, my locks with the damp of the night. Always the night. Now it goes to the feminine, and she responds. I've taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I dirty them again? Not tonight. Come back tomorrow. I've had a long day. Did you have to come tonight? She's not wearing the garments of salvation, the wedding garments. She's not wearing the wedding garments of the book of Revelation. My beloved extended his hand through the opening, and my feelings were aroused for him. 
I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands drip with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. Now notice, she is anointed for burial. Verse 6, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and gone. My heart went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him, but I did not find him. I called to him, but he did not answer me. The watchmen who make the rounds in the city found me. They struck me and wounded me. The guardsmen on the walls took away my shawl from me. <laughs> then is the refrain. You see the police beating her and stuff like that? Persecution. What's going to happen to those who are not raptured? Jeremiah 8.20, harvest is ended, summer is past, and they will say, although harvest is ended and summer is past, we are not saved. They've had it. Her best dream and her worst nightmare. She gets into the bed of the flesh. Isaiah 28 warns about this. Woe to those who get into the bed of the flesh. They don't want to get up. They've got their own plans, their own ideas. What's happening today? Every deception of Satan aimed at believers today has to do with getting us or trying to persuade us to trust in this life or this world in some way. What is on back of the money preachers, the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it stuff? Trusting in material happiness. What's on back of kingdom now theology, dominionism? Trusting in political power, kingdom dominion. What's on back of the purpose-driven lie? The same thing. Don't worry about the return of Christ. It's about now. We have to save the environment. Well, we should take care of the environment, but we're not going to save it. Get into their own thing. I don't want to get up. Chapter 3, the best dream. Chapter 5, it's her worst nightmare. The wise and the prudent. Now understand how it puts it. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. It's a lamp. But the old-time Pentecostals used to sing, Give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. Keep it burning to the break of day. Sing Hosanna. Better in Hebrew. Who not ten sim chabelev, hallelujah. Who not ten sim chabelev, sheli. Who not ten sim chabelev, hallelujah. Hallelujah, la kol yamim. Shir Hosanna, shir Hosanna, shir Hosanna, the Melech Hamlachim. Sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. In other words, what good is a flashlight with no batteries? The Bible has become a prop. I was recently in New York with family, New York City. I went to a Baptist church on Sunday that I used to attend as a young believer where there were famous preachers at one time, Bible expositors like Donald Hubbard and Alan Redpath and various people like this, Stephen Olford. The place was known for fantastically anointed expository Bible preaching and exposition. The teaching had become so shallow compared to what it was when I was first saved. Churches and denominations that were strong in the word only serve milk now, not meat. Milk is for babies and it's good. You need the calcium when you're a baby, but you need the protein in order to grow. It's just not happening. More and more churches have degenerated further and further away from the Word of God. Most of our leading theological seminaries and Bible colleges have degenerated academically from the point of view of an emphasis on biblical scholarship. They're teaching more and more church growth formulas and programmatics, things based on marketing and psychology. This has become the emphasis. 
there's less and less emphasis of the word. Now, you might not notice it in Calvary because Calvary, most Calvaries are still sticking to the book-by-book, verse-by-verse format established by Chuck Smith. You might not notice it as much in most Calvaries, but even some Calvaries are beginning to go off for sure. It's just going down. Most of my fellow charismatics never had oil in their lamp to begin with. Their theology was experiential. Their spirituality was based on mysticism and emotionalism. It was not even an authentic spirituality, and they never had any understanding of the word anyway. It was, I feel and God showed me, and I had a picture and all this stuff. That was their doctrine. They never had any batteries in the flashlight to begin with. In the last days, understanding becomes a barometer of faithfulness. Look what it says in the book of Daniel, chapter 12. Verse 3, those whose insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. Those who lead many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words. Seal up the book. It's sealed. We see the seals being broken in the book of Revelation. These visions that Daniel had are broken in the book of Revelation. Seal it up <coughs> until the end time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. But then we read in verse 10, Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. None of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. The wise virgins will understand, the foolish will not. Now imagine, at a time when we see biblical prophecy being fulfilled in the Middle East, in Europe, in the church, we should be getting into the Scriptures further and deeper. And things are generally becoming more and more shallow to the point where you have a Rick Warren deceiving the body of Christ, telling people, avoid end time prophecy. Even though Jesus repeatedly warned us to be alert and watch out for it. He teaches a diametric opposite message to what Jesus warned us. And people think he's good for whatever he is. He's good for the cause of the enemy. He's not good for the cause of Christ. I told him I would debate him anywhere as long as it's open to the public and in front of a camera. But let's look. What good is the flashlight with no batteries? You have this guy in Houston, Joel Austin. I'm only stating facts. When asked on Larry King Live, is homosexuality a sin? Well, I don't know about that. I just know that God loves you. He just loves everybody. That's what he said. Yet he comes out every week with the Bible, puts it on the podium, and that's it. It's a prop. The Bible is a prop. They don't believe it. They don't even read it. They didn't read it. Again, Mr. Warren on CNN and Larry King Live, you've seen it. Apologizing to the homosexual and lesbian community for the Christians supporting Proposition 8 in California. He said, I've never been against it. Well, in fact, he actually was at one point, so he didn't tell the truth. Don't apologize on my behalf. I'm not against homosexuals and lesbians. I'm for homosexuals and lesbians. Therefore, I want them to know the truth. Jesus can set them free from their perversion the same as he set me free from my cocaine addiction. There's no oil in the lamp. There's no batteries in the flashlight. If he's coming in the night, how are you going to see when he gets here? Culturally, the brides would go out with the torches, with the lamps. But they had to have the oil in the lamps before he came. What good is running out with a flashlight with no batteries? The time to have the batteries is before he comes. The time to get the oil for the lamp is before the bridegroom comes. 
Well, they're not getting oil. I've pointed out before. When I was first saved, if you went to a Christian bookshop, you'd find all kinds of books about the return of Jesus. Some good, some not so good. Late great planet Earth, etc. But at least people were interested in his coming. Now here we are nearly 40 years later since I was first saved, and there is far less interest in the return of Christ now than there was 40 years ago. There's less interest now than there was 40 years ago. What does that tell you? That's a deception in itself. The books were late great planet Earth and things like this in the Christian classics, Tozer and My Utmost for His Highest and Screw Tape Letters and Watch Me Knee, was stuff like that. That was in the Christian bookshops when I was first saved. What's there now? Seven Steps to Prosperity, Five Keys to Victory, The Purpose Driven Lie, The Shack. They ought to call it the Lunatic Asylum. This is what they're reading. There's no oil in the lamp. They don't have a clue. If anyone read the scriptures and understood it, they would know why the purpose-driven lie is a lie. They would know why the shack is rubbish. They would know it for themselves. It's getting dark. And they're still not getting the batteries. It's getting darker. But they're still not getting the batteries. They're just happy clappy. The bride is in bed and doesn't want to get up. The lowest people on the totem pole in a prison culture are sex criminals. They have to put them in isolation from other criminals because the others will kill them, use them as women, then kill them. There's nobody lower in prison than a sex criminal. Sex criminals, these like serial rapists, no normal male, even an unsaved male, no normal male would want the woman who doesn't want him. Only a sicko, only a pervert, only a sicko does. These rapists are sickos. No normal male, I can't, no normal male wants a woman who doesn't want him. Only a sicko does. Well, Jesus Christ is no sicko. He wants a bride who wants him. Don't awaken my love until she pleases. Night after night I sought him whom my soul loves. That was her best dream in chapter 3. She was ready. The other is the worst nightmare. Well, already I see what's happening. It's getting darker. And I see certain people stocking up on oil. I see certain people stocking up on batteries. I see certain people, certain churches, certain pastors getting ready for the bridegroom cometh. They want to be able to know what's happening. They want to be able to see things for what they are. And I see others. They don't see any need for oil in their lamps. There's no illumination of the Holy Spirit in their understanding of Scripture. It's based on psychology. You've got liberal higher critics. They reduce the Bible simply to history and literature, but they don't even believe it's historicity. These are people with PhDs who don't believe what they're studying. And they dominate Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge. And it's getting worse. Now evangelical institutions of higher learning are being swallowed up with psychobabble, marketing, consumerism, compromising on the fundamentals to the point where people I once respected will compromise with Mormonism. People like Ravi Zacharias. I respected that guy. How can they be doing this? Where is it going? The wise and the foolish. That's the way it's going to be. That was Matthew 25. The Song of Solomon was what was being read in the synagogues that very week. The best dream or the worst nightmare. 
for every one of us, for our families, our marriages, for our churches. When he comes, it's going to be the best dream or the worst nightmare. Get oil in your lamps. Keep it burning. Make sure you have plenty of batteries for your flashlight. Go back. Read the old stuff. Read Watchman Nee. Read Tozer. Read F.B. Meyer. Read the screw tape letters. With people like that, you'll never go wrong. Read the messianic scholars like Arnold Fruchtenbaum, not the hyper-messianic nuts. A good church where Jesus is honored, the true gospel is preached without compromise, and where the word of God is expounded faithfully. Get oil in your lamps, keep it burning. I am afraid for many people, for many people who profess to be Christians, they are heading for their worst nightmare. My prayer for myself and my prayer for you is that we will be ready for our best dream. The bridegroom cometh. The new Jerusalem cometh. As we say in Hebrew, Shana haba be'yerushalayim next year in Jerusalem. God bless.